Domain tools help security analysts turn threat data into threat intelligence. They take indicators from your network, including domains and IP addresses, and connect them with nearly every active domain on the internet. Those connections drive risk assessments, help profile attackers, guide online fraud investigations, and map cyber activity to attacker infrastructure. Fortune 1000 companies, global government agencies, and leading security solutions vendors use the Domain Tools platform as a critical ingredient in their threat investigations and proactive defenses. For more information, visit securityweekly.com forward slash domain tools. The greatest threat to businesses today isn't the outsider trying to get in. It's the people you trust, the ones who already have the keys, your employees, your contractors, and privileged users. 60% of online attacks are carried out by insiders. To stop these insider threats, you need to see what users are doing before an incident occurs. Observe it combats insider threats by detecting risk activity, investigating in minutes, effectively responding, and stopping data lost. Give it a test drive at observeit.com forward slash security weekly. Are you looking for high-performance data storage that's easy to use yet secure enough for the Department of Defense? Look no further. Racktop Systems gives business software-defined data storage complete with embedded compliance, security, and data encryption. Don't let cyber threats, regulatory demands, or the complexity and growth of your data overwhelm your business. Racktop's high-performance data management platform gives you the tools you need to address the most demanding data challenges. Think beyond storage. To learn more, visit racktopsystems.com. Welcome back, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. Uh, I don't think... Do I have another announcement? Our on-demand material. Make sure you go to securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. Find some great webcasts there uh, that you can register for if you missed them. We've got one coming up pretty soon on Active Directory Security. Not to be missed. All righty. I don't know what the movement was to Google Cloud, John. Yeah. I don't know how much you know about what Google. What the hell? Apparently, was this intentional or is this just I, how it worked out this week? I, I don't know. Maybe Google had a, a conference. Usually when you see a string of announcements like this to a platform, it means the platform provider had some kind of conference. Everyone who's attending that conference held off their support for that platform until the conference. So I now that I think about it, I probably should have looked and seen what conference was that, that triggered this. But... Uh, Anyway, I, I, how do you feel about Google's cloud platform? I haven't really looked into it that much, John. We haven't used it that much, but mm. you know, if they just made it a little bit easier to use, like then what Amazon, then then they're going to do well. I, but, okay. Yeah. Um, well, and I, that I, I mean, I think that's pretty on point with a lot of Google solutions, dude. Like I they mean, are easy to use predominantly. Yeah, but in some like really aren't they? Missed the mark, and Google's shit just is horrible. To, I mean, look at Hangouts. I mean. Oh my god! Oh, oh my god! Good. Oh my god! Train so yeah, once you start using it, it's fairly easy. But finding it, so we just found out that Google has a Slack alternative that's called Google Hangouts Chat. It's yeah. not Google Chat. It's not Google Hangouts. Right. It's Google Hangouts Chat. That's completely different. But once you get in, it is pretty easy to. Uh, it, it it is pretty easy to use the stuff. But I, I honestly don't know um, like how they stack up. You know, when we're looking at it, I think that Google Cloud Platform. I think that they're about half, from what I've heard, mm -hmm. of what Amazon is doing right now. A mm -hmm. um, little bit behind Am uh, Azure was the last time I, I checked. Um, so is this growing? Are they going to start taking market share from uh, Amazon? No idea yet. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't see that. I mean, I don't know what the rush of security solutions to Google Cloud are. Uh, it could be that maybe it's easy to implement a security solution on Google Cloud. Versus Amazon versus Azure, so they're like, "Hey, we can add this, and it's re there's not a whole lot, you know, going on on Google Cloud in terms of market share, but we can add it really easily and make a big announcement about it." <laughs> we need to we need to invoke Rich Mogul. Uh, we need to get mm. we need to get him on the show we because That's a good, he'll know yes. he'll know it like completely on right. Um, uh, so I don't know. There was an announcement about Pulse Secure VPN enhanced to support what? hybrid. I I don't. I don't know. Yeah, that was a weird one. It was an opinion article from Network World that was pretty much a full sales pitch. And correct me if I'm wrong, but Pulse Secure is just a really good VPN that runs on a wide variety of different platforms. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Right. But it's weird how that gets mixed in. And it's like, we help solve the IoT problem. How do you, oh, whatever, uh, whatever. I mean, it looks like it's a good VPN. There's no question about it. Yeah, I've, I've had some interesting conversations about how you manage your third-party vendors and how you provide them with access. And I, 
I kind of struggle to come up with a, a solution. I know there are vendors that, that message on that they help with this problem. I don't understand exactly how. Have, have you had to deal with that, John, and any of your you know customers, clients, or you know folks that you advise that like how do they provision access to contractors or vendors to come in and gain access to the network and rotate their credentials or keys? It That's a hard. Pro- is that a hard problem, or am I? It, it is. It is no question that it is a hard problem. It's a hard problem for a variety of reasons. One, a lot of organizations just don't even have that remote capability, like built in, like with dedicated processes at all, um, and that sucks because then they don't know how to do it at all. And then you have some that have specific VPNs that you're supposed to use, and you got to get sent out a crypto key or a soft token, or they ship you out a notebook computer. It's different for every single customer. But oddly enough, we've had a lot of customers recently that are like, well, how about we just use log me in? Like, well, we're okay with it if you're okay with it, right. I guess. And we just do that. And that kind of shows with security, a lot of times things boil down to the lowest common denominator and the easiest thing to get the job done, right. which is a little bit terrifying. So yes, it is a problem. Do, do do they solve it in such a way that it makes that problem go away? Mm, I don't think so. Um, so I had another interesting scenario, John, that I wanted to run by you. In short of just the news, like really being kind of boring mm-hmm. this week. Um, so I'm going to spring this on you uh, live on the air. So if you're, <laughs> let's say you're a large retail uh, organization, right? Doesn't matter what the retailer, you know, what whatever you're selling in your stores doesn't matter, right? You've got a large retailer. You've got stores all over the U.S., let's say. I mean, you could have them global. Let's just say you've got stores all over the U.S., multiple locations. And inside those stores, more and more, you've got some kind of device that needs to connect to the network, right? I mean... Okay. No, I'm not talking an infrastructure device like in a, a cash register, right? But you know, you've got some other supporting IoT infrastructure that's managed and provided by a a third party vendor, and that device has to talk to the network. Um, how do you how do you manage these devices at all of these locations? How do you provision them access to your network? Um, keep them segregated. Keep them authenticated. Um, and ensure that whether it's wireless or plugged in, right? Like, is that device that particular device? Like if someone hacks this IoT so, device, how do I limit it? So a couple of different things. Normally how it's done is it's just dropped in. Mm-hmm. Um, the target, well, the target breach was different, but um, it's similar. It's similar in the fact that many of these products just get dropped in and then the vendor themselves will either have built-in capability or they'll do a reverse SSH tunnel out of the environment so they can maintain the mm-hmm. product on behalf of the customer, which is a nightmare. And that's what we see more often than not is you basically drop these things. Let's say HVAC controls, let's say lighting controls, any of these, the vendor themselves can actually reach into your network and troubleshoot that particular product. Right. And there's no segmentation. Organizations that tend to do it correct, they try to implement some type of segmentation. They can either put it on a separate VLAN, which is great, mm-hmm. I suppose, if you if you know how to handle that and do that in your own organization. And the really advanced organizations will actually move towards like a four scout solution yeah. where you can actually implement policies based on that IP address, but also identifying that specific device uh, based on user agent strings, its uh, MAC address. So you have a better like profile of what that device is. So someone just can't go in, clone the MAC address, and then start using that IP address that has been allocated on the network. So I would say the organizations that do that correctly are probably less than 1%. Uh, the vast really? majority of them just drop it so and like turn on. So like large retailers go. that have some kind of network admission or knack, for lack of a better term, right? Now I see where the messaging on IoT is for these companies. It was, was it Fort Scale that you mentioned, right? Is the, mm-hmm. the leader in Fort that Scout. Ca- Fort, Fort Scout. Fort, Fort Scout, Scout, rather. Fort Scout is a leader in that category. And so you're only seeing a small percentage of large retail customers using that that solution. Yeah, but you would I would also throw like Cisco Ice in this as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's a very small percentage of the organizations that have any level of segmentation. Let's take the IoT conversation off the table, mm-hmm. uh, but any segmentation whatsoever. Usually, once you're on the network, you have the ability to move pretty much anywhere you want to go. And and retailers really have the suck in this situation because they have thousands and thousands of locations all across the world potentially and any solution that you have has to be if it's a physical device has to go out to every store right if it's a software device you have to maintain connectivity uh with every store which all of which are hard problems well and today i was talking with a customer um 
one of my first customers this morning, and they were talking about automated incident response tools. So basically, if you detect an attack, have the tool automatically segment off that IP address yep. or start sending resets, DOS that product. And those products sound fantastic. The issue with those products, though, is the first time that that product does something where it takes proactive action and it shuts down access mm -hmm. to that IP address or it blocks that traffic and it misidentifies it and it's a false positive and it impacts production, then that is basically the last time that product will ever be in that mode. Because universally, we see organizations where a security product does that type of proactive type security shutting things down. And if it kills the wrong thing, they effectively shut off that capability in that product because you can't stop production. You just can't. And I think that that's that really fine line. I think that there's a lot of products out there that do an amazing job of trying to secure a network. But once they start taking that automated action, once they start taking that step and they do it incorrectly, it completely works against ever having anything like that in an organization again. Yeah, and I, that's been my issue with automation. You know, my question, anytime you've got any technology that's automatically looking for a condition and then automatically taking an action, which is remove it from the network or put it somewhere else, I'm like, what if an attacker spoofs a bunch of stuff? And this... The first time I had this conversation is when we were talking about wireless and wireless intrusion prevention systems. I'm like, mm -hmm. so layer, there's no security or very little security on layer two in, in Wi-Fi. I mean, we've got some technologies that have evolved over the years. Early on, there was like nothing on layer nothing. two. Like yeah, layers just wide open. Anything. Right? I'm like, what if I just spoof everything and DOS the whole network? What if I start spoofing like important things like your DNS server, right? Or, mm -hmm. you know, access to you. And it just, you know, the list can go on. I'm like... I worry that those technologies will be turned uh, against you. It's always been my concern. Yep. I think we've gotten better, you know, in the past 15 years in that front, but. Yeah, still very much a problem. Uh, there was a story I wanted to talk about since everything was about Google Cloud Compute Platform. I really liked this threat stack, uh, threat stack article. Oh, yeah. I wanted to get your take on that, John. So, all right. So this is another question that I had uh, late last week. Uh, granted, it's talking about their product, right? But the whole idea of what is happening now in the world of development and even with DevOps is you don't really look. What was the analogy someone came up with? You don't look at your uh, uh, at your servers as something that you take care of. You love care feed for an extended period of time. You look at it as something that you're going to take out and shoot in the very near future. And mm -hmm. you're constantly deploying new hard well new hardware. You're deploying new operating systems. You're deploying new application stacks and then ripping them out. And one of the big problems is if you look at DevOps, you look at a lot of different rapid development lifecycle processes that are out there. These things have accelerated in a way that security has not been able to keep up with. And I really like the, the idea of talking about configuration auditing, doing that type of security assessment excuse me, security assessments, continuous security assessments, and baking that security assessment in at all levels. Like we've been talking about for 15, 20 years, you need to have security baked in through the entire lifecycle process. And as much as we've ever said that, no one ever did that. Mm. Now, all of a sudden, we have organizations that are... Um, they're basically trying to do their once every three months security assessment process in a rapid development lifecycle process with DevOps. It just doesn't work very well. So uh, it is funny. People are like, I hate SecOps. You know, it's just ripping off DevOps. It's DevOps. There is no SecOps. There is no DevOps. Or there is DevOps. It's not SecOps because security operations should be part of DevOps. And I think that that argument is garbage. I think that the only way that organizations are going to implement DevOps properly with security is if they understand that security operations coupled with DevOps, that rapid development life cycle is something that has to happen. Um, they're not unique and they're not independent of each and, other. And I understand done, that. When but done we have to right, talk about them differently. And when done right, it's a huge security advantage. However, it's that mindset shift that is is like highly annoying and takes old people like us, John, a, a long time to kind of like grok and figure out. And one of the things that I realized when I was putting together my Docker uh, security talk that I did at Source early, earlier this year, the message that it I was like, how do I distill this down? And I was like, oh, and the stuff I was reading and supporting materials, you have to understand in your point on like traditional IT infrastructure, like care and feeding versus mm -hmm. what we have today with like containers is that containers are immutable. And that's something that a traditional security and sysadmins like, it takes a long time to like grok that concept and be like the infrastructure I'm providing is immutable. Like it goes away and it gets rebuilt all the time. And, mm -hmm. but now for security, that's a huge advantage, huge advantage, because 
let's say an attacker gains a foothold. Well, I'm just going to go deploy a new container. And by the way, as I'm building and deploying things, to speak to the article and your point, John, if we're applying configuration and auditing in that process, like we're just always getting better at security because we're always pushing out new infrastructure. Um, if you're a, a, a traditional sysadmin and developer, getting over that concept that containers are immutable is is hard. Once you get there, you're like, oh, but like it, it takes some some time to to do that. And I well, encourage our community to go. And I'm seeing containers be embraced more and more, a lot more projects. Um, and I think the the very uh, early kind of wins we're seeing with that is if you need to build a lab or go test stuff out, like all of your security tools and all of your vulnerable applications now, like pretty much someone has taken that and putting it in a container. It just makes that process so much easier. Absolutely. Absolutely. All righty. Well, John, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for listening and watching this edition of Enterprise Security Weekly. See you next time.